What is going on, everyone? Welcome to a new podcast. I was almost going to say Sports Talk with Broads. I'm so accustomed to vomiting that out of my mouth. But no, no, no. Today, it's Open Ice Hits. It is the pilot episode of our first NHL podcast. I'm so excited. Just to give a little opening scene, if you will, on what this is. In the Philadelphia market, I hear all the time about the Eagles and the Sixers, and I understand why, and I'm right involved in that. But there's not enough hockey talk in this damn city. There's not. And I wanted to bring the passion that I have for the Eagles, for the Sixers, for the game of hockey, because I got three TVs on my wall where I'm watching NHL Game Center, and I'm flipping through all the games, and it deserves to be discussed. So I thought in my head, who would be... Great to join me in this type of conversation. Oh, it's a no-brainer. It's Kevin Durso, 97.3 ESPN's Flyers Insider. Here we are at 2 a.m. every single night. Dude, did you see that Edmonton game? Did you see what happened with the LA Kings? We're nonstop, nonstop. So it was a no-brainer. With that being said, let's enter the man, the myth, the legend, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Kevin Durso. How are you, Kevin? What's up, Broads? This is going to be awesome. I'm I'm so thrilled to be doing something like this. I, I told you when we were talking about this, this feels like a long time coming because we talk about stuff all the time. You're right. We talk back and forth about different games, and it's not just, hey, what's going on with the Flyers and you wanting to know what I know about what's going on on the inside scoop here and things like that. It's it's everything else on top of it. It's Did you see what happened in that Edmonton game? Did you see what happened in the Colorado game? Are you watching this one tonight? Which one are you watching tonight? How many TVs can you get up at one time? to watch it like that that is exactly what it is for me too and so this is like the perfect way for me to have someone else to talk to about it too and like just to just just riff about hockey all day and you know just keep doing this as constantly as possible because this is going to be a lot of fun it is oh there's no doubt that it is and not only is it going to be me and you but weekly we will have on Johnny Gaudreau of the Calgary Flames to check in, to give us his thoughts on the team's recent stretch, on his personal play, maybe throw some funny questions out there about the teammates and what's going on around the league. So weekly, we will get an update from Johnny Gaudreau. So that is also an element added to the show. And not only him, we'll throw other guests in throughout as well. So all around, when I think about open ice hits, I get the goosebumpster, so I really do. Yeah, it's that's one of the best parts of hockey, isn't it? You know, open ice hits. You get that good hard collision. Well, hey, listen, that, that wasn't well, my game. I was chipping pucks off the glass and changing within 20 seconds because yeah. I didn't want to get beat. Yeah, chip pucks deep, right? Damn you know, right. just get, that's it. You know, that's the way it goes. But you know, this is just going to be so cool to have a lot of different people tap into this. You know, it's not just us that's going to be here talking hockey all the time. It's going to be these other guys as well, and. Having Johnny Gaudreau be our weekly guest is going to be something that's really awesome. I think he's great. I, you know, not only is he a great player and a local guy at that, but you know, he he's got a lot of love for the game too, and you see that and you can hear that when he talks about it. So it's going to be great to have him on. Absolutely, and and I think with that, it's time to get into it. Time to dive into it, and where I want to begin is here. I love watching this Eastern Conference, and look, all the names are all over the place right now. The Conference of the Flyers, like I'm I'm obviously embracing this Eastern Conference and watching the Boston Bruins play and watching the Capitals and and watching where this team is. This Canadian division. This (laughs) Canadian division is my favorite. I think, call me crazy, call me an ass, I think they got to find a way to do this long term. Am I crazy to think that, one, that's possible, and two, that they should do it? I don't I don't know about that. I mean, I don't think you're crazy to want it because I think that it's really producing some good hockey. You know, I mean, it just is. I don't know if there's going to be a path for it because I do think that, you know, at the end of the day, you need to have that path carved out also for Connor McDavid to play Sidney Crosby and for Austin Matthews to play Alex Ovechkin. You just have to, I think, if they're all going to be, you know, in whatever way they Stop have to. Stop making sense. I don't like this logical approach. I want this <laughs> irrational conversation about watching the Canadian <laughs> Canadian teams just play each other 82 games a year. 
<laughs> I, I, 82 is really stretching it now, though, because, I mean, that's a division of what? Se that's seven teams in the Canadian division that they're already going to be sick of each other after playing nine, ten games against each other. I mean, that's that's what makes it great for us is nine, ten games against each other. That means, what, ten different times we get the Battle of Alberta, Calgary, Edmonton, you know, the, probably the, the hottest rivalry in hockey right now. And then, you, you know, throw in the other side, too. I mean, what, what was it? We had Toronto and Montreal playing the other night. That was just, just as fun, fun to watch as the other ones are. You know, it's just great to watch these different teams and see these rivalries get created or get enhanced by this or however you want to look at it. But there's, you know, it's a, it's a very competitive division. That's what I love about it. It's a competitive division. There's really not, you know, you know Ottawa's even going to be on the up and coming here because of the guys they've drafted lately. So they'll even get there. They're not there yet. You know, they've played in some games where they've pulled something off. They beat uh, Winnipeg the other night. But all these other teams are just hanging in there, and it's every night you're getting some marquee matchup, it feels like. It's ex it's excellent. Yeah, you might be giving the Ottawa Senators a little too much faith, a little too much love, because there were some disastrous moments. They were going through three-game stretches where they were getting outscored by an insane amount. And coming into the year, everyone did think that they would take that step, they would take that jump to at least put them in a competitive category. I don't know if I've seen that enough this season, though. It's been bad, and I think it's put a lot of pressure on the front office. I know Brady Kachuk is a fun watch, and, and they have younger players, and they they are a core of younger guys, but I did anticipate seeing more fight involved than what I've seen, even though they did have a, a good win against Winnipeg as of recent. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I don't think I expect them to take that kind of leap. You know, I, like I didn't think they were playoff team material no, or anything no, no, like no. that. I, I think I just expected a little bit better, and I think they've had some hard luck too. I mean, they've had a lot of different situations and you're playing against teams that we know are better than they are, you know, that we just know. I mean, you're not going to sit there and put Ottawa out there against Edmonton on a constant basis and say, well, the team with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl isn't better than the team with a lot of up and coming prospects there. They'll be there. I think, you know, like Stutzla, I think is going to be outstanding in this yes. league, but, but it's early for him and you can see that it's early for him and he's had his moments, but he's not there yet, and, but he's getting, basically on the fly education here of how to play at the NHL level, which is great. You know, I, I think that that's always a good thing for the league to see and ha see how these guys just adjust to the game in such a big way. So yeah, I, I'm not worried about the fact that Ottawa is still a bottom feeder of that division per se. They'll get there eventually. And I think we'll see them at a level where they're as competitive as they were sometimes in those early 2000s years when they had a lot of talent on the team and they were getting deeper in playoff runs I think we'll get back there at some point I mean it wasn't that far long ago that they were in a conference yeah in a conference final you know they were that close to a Stanley Cup run you know and things like that but they're they're getting there they'll be there eventually down the, down the line but every other team in that division is just right on it's right there and you can even look at the ones that wouldn't make the playoffs and go well they were in it last year so they're close too. like they of course they're close they're, that's a really good division yeah, Ottawa, when they blew it all up, they got rid of Carlson, they got rid of Stone, they got rid of everybody, and they wanted to retool this thing, and that's why I thought that maybe people looked at them as, okay, well, they did blow it up, and then they started to grab pieces here and there. Maybe they will be a team that, they might lose games, but they will be involved in games, and you mentioned how deep this division is, it's going to be tough to hang with the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Montreal Canadiens and what well, we thought Vancouver, although they'd look to take a step back and we'll get into them in just a moment. But still, it's obviously a division where everyone can go head to head nonstop throughout the week. It's crazy to see them be this putrid. It's no effort type of losses and that could be concerning. And they made a move though. They did make a move, and they traded for Dezingle. And I just want to get your perspective on that. Now, they traded Galchenyuk and Paquette, and both of those guys. Galchenyuk has one goal in eight games and is dash six. And Paquette has one goal in nine games, dash eight. How do you see this from both sides? You're now getting Dezingle back, which if you remember, when he was a free agent and he was looking to go somewhere, there was an offer on the table from Ottawa. He elected to go in another direction and left money on the table, and now he's kind of been bouncing around. He waited out a significant amount of time in free agency. Is that them trying to acquire a veteran presence to calm these young guys down to maybe add that layer of veteran leadership so this doesn't spiral out of control too much? Well, I do think there's a level of familiarity there because he was with Ottawa for a little while. And, and they, I, I, by all accounts, they liked having him. You know, that's the thing. Um, 
I don't, I don't know how, you know, how much it impacts them per se. I, I think that they're just looking for, uh, maybe Dezingle gives them a little bit more two way than I think they had from the other guys. Maybe that's what it is. And I, I don't think Paquette's a bad two way player. I think that, I think that number is just a product of being on the team he's on. But Galchenyuk is a different story. I think, I mean, he, this guy's been bounced around. He's, this is the fifth team we'll have been on in less than three years. I think that's a significant note there. You know, if you're bouncing around that much, I mean, he's starting to put on the frequent flyer miles the way that uh, Mike Sillinger used to back in the day. You know, like th- these are guys who are well traveled. A modern day version of it would be a Lee Stempniak. I mean, Lee Stempniak got traded at the deadline like every year, right? You know, so Galchenyuk is becoming one of those types of players. So I'm not surprised that he's involved in the deal in some way i guess Uh, and he was already placed on waivers too i believe so that's another story to line to it he's just i don't know where he's gonna stick but i do think being who like who the deal was made with too because it was with carolina i mean i I think paquette could be a great fit down there i think he's gonna fit right in with rod brindamore's system so it'll be interesting to watch him go into that situation but i think dezingle gives ottawa some familiarity some somebody they already know a lot about somebody who some of those guys probably have a little bit of familiarity with from just even a couple of early situations in their careers or something like that. Cause it's a young team. We've established that and it's not the same team that it was four years ago, but I do think that there's something to it that they got, got a guy who they know what to expect from them. And that says a lot. I look at it more from a veteran presence involved with a lot of these younger guys, because if it gets too sloppy too early, which it's clearly in that category right now, it could become a, a hard sell, and it would be a hard watch, and it would be tough to see night in and night out to get destroyed. And, and this can be a good transition to Vancouver as we look throughout this division because there was a stretch of a handful of games in a row where Vancouver was able to beat up on Ottawa. So the Vancouver fans thought, hold on a second, maybe we're not as bad as we thought because the season started out kind to F for them, and now what do you know? It looks like when you play a different opponent, not name the Senators, you might be that version of yourself that you were afraid of. Pedersen did not come out guns blazing like you thought he would. Where is this Vancouver team? Are they real? Are they fake? Is this a product of the division, or is this really who they are? The goaltending situation. See, they signed Hopi, right? It doesn't look like Hope he has it. If I'm the guy making the decisions, I'd rather roll forward with someone like Thatcher Demko because he's a stud. Yeah, that's that's the big question mark for me too because here's the thing about Vancouver. I love their head coach. I think Travis Green's an excellent head coach. I love some of the foundation pieces that they have. I like Patterson a lot. Quinn Hughes is outstanding, and I think that they've got a lot of good forwards up there that can do a lot of good things. I think you know, Bo Horvat's a really good leader, and I think about Brock Besser and the steps that he's taken to continue to progress in his career. I just don't know if I get a lot of it, you know, especially the goaltending thing. You're right, because I think that Jacob Markstrom is underrated, and that's the guy who they had last year and who was helping them really get through a lot of the playoffs, and even after when they were in the playoffs, then Thatcher Demko comes along and starts making starts, and he looks just as good, even if not better sometimes, and you're going... Wow, look at the situation there. And they've got one guy who's in the here and now looking really good. And they've got the guy for the future. They're all set. And then they'd let Markstrom walk. And their solution to replace him was Braden Holpe. And I'm like just wondering because the, the Braden Holpe that I knew from the year of his contract being up and having the ability to sign with somebody was a guy who got replaced by a rookie. You know, here's a guy who in Washington he had won a Stanley Cup two years earlier. And here comes Zilia Samsonov. And now you're the second guy now. We like Samsonov better. So that. Can, I understand how that can force his hand in making a decision where to play, but I just don't know if that was the best answer for Vancouver because you had a really good situation. You had a really good tandem, and it's like the opposite effect of a lot of these tandems where it's instead the veteran guy who's been around for a little while is probably your number one go-to, and the kid is the one who you're going you're gonna to lean on when you need to and let him grow into the role eventually. And I don't, they're still trying to do that. And I think they're trying to do it now even worse than they were before because of Holtby being where he is in his career. I think that that changes some things a little bit. I don't think that it, I, it doesn't mean I think Holtby's a bad goalie. It's just, he's not what he was in Washington during his prime anymore. And I think they took a step back in that area because of letting Markstrom walk. Well, how about this? Is this a scenario where when Seattle comes into town, Hopi is a name that they might look at when it when it comes to the expansion draft, and then maybe it helps out both teams. You're now a franchise that, look, we're talking about his issues, but you're a team that has nobody. You have the chance to get a Hopi. It's not the worst situation in the world. And then that takes that situation off of Vancouver, and Thatcher Demko can then become the guy. 
Yeah, that's a great, great point because everybody I think is banking on something with the expansion draft. Every team out there is trying to make preparations for what's this, what's this situation going to be like? Who do we know we have to protect because of no trade clauses or modified, no trades or however you want to look at it. Who do we have to protect? And then who do we have that we can expose without feeling like they're going to be guys who are easy to take from like it's easy where it's easy poaching because you have a name out there that you go. Absolutely. Who wouldn't want that guy? You know, Vancouver's in that unique position because Holtby is a name and there's a lot of teams out there who, if they were starting their team from nothing would say, yeah, that's a great name to build to use as a starting point when it comes to the goaltending. But Vancouver's holding on to Demko in that position as well, where you've got him in your back pocket, ready to maybe take over that starting role in another year. And maybe that's exactly what they're setting themselves up for is he's going to be the guy after this season. Maybe there's a little bit of a dynamic and I don't know, you know, they didn't make these decisions knowing what this season was going to look like. But the shortened season thing kind of plays into it a little bit, too, because maybe they're almost showcasing Holtby a little bit more to try to get him out there. So that this way, again, Demko's the guy who nobody seems to think about, even when they do decide to protect him and they keep him you know, in their back pocket ready to go. Uh, it's It remains to be seen, but every team's doing this. You're right. Like every team is thinking about who's going in expansion. And there's plenty of teams out there that have a tough enough time trying to figure out who to keep and who to let be exposed and possibly be taken by a new expansion team. So I wouldn't be shocked if Holtby is, is one of those guys because he is a recognizable name and Vancouver's going to only be able to protect one. And if they don't protect Demko, I think any team that's starting off from scratch would want a goalie like that, who is not only has the potential to be somebody great, but also is that young and that fresh into his career that you can go, you could really build around him as opposed to Holpe, who you know you're getting with only a few years left probably. I sort of have conflicting feelings on the expansion draft, though, because I understand you don't want a team to come in here and you have to be stuck watching something similar to the Detroit Red Wings where it's yeah. unwatchable. Let's be realistic. You know, Dylan Larkin is a fantastic player, but it's tough to watch anything that the Red Wings to who? Him and Bertuzzi? I mean, you can only take so much of that before you realize, wow, this is garbage. Let me flip through another game and see what's on. So you don't want to have that if you're the NHL. At the same time, there's been franchises grinding forever in this area of we're competitive, but what can we do to now get ourselves over the hump? And we're involved, but we're just a couple pieces shy. What type of moves can we make? There's been teams who've been stuck in that area for such a long time, and they've been pursuing. And here's a team that can handpick players, and Vegas Golden Knights is in the Stanley Cup Finals. And, and I know the story was awesome, and nobody thought that they could do it, and it was all these team, all these teammates that came together because they weren't kept by their other squads. So the storyline is magnificent. I'm not downplaying that. But don't you think it's kind of flawed to enter a, a franchise and enter a league and have a chance to be a serious competitor right from the beginning? Well, you're, you're probably saying that because you're thinking of all the other expansions during, especially during our lifetime. You're thinking about Minnesota, Columbus, Nashville, you know, these teams that put it together and try to build a team the same way. And then take 10, 15 years before they make the real playoff run. You know, think about, you know, Nashville finally made a Stanley Cup final. What was it now? Four years ago, I guess it was. And you're you're going, well, that took 15 years of their existence to even get to that level where they were in the conversation where people were talking about them. That's an entire run of players that you build your foundation around and build a core and then move on from that core and build another core. That's not like just starting from scratch and getting a bunch of players from a bunch of different teams and having the right unit right in place from the beginning. And think about how close Vegas has been in all of those years. They go to the cup final the first year, the second year, who knows? They probably would have been on track to maybe make a similar run. If not for the way that that game seven against San Jose went down. And then they do the same thing. They were what in a conference final against Dallas. So that's three years. That's three really good playoff runs. They're right there. And they keep getting these players, you know, they keep getting players through trades or however they have to do it, but they keep loading up their team with some significant talent. I mean, they're not just getting nobodies here. They're getting teams. They're getting players that people know, and that's really significant. And that's why they're in the running. And look, maybe some of that has to do with the first year. You know, you got all these misfits, so to speak, and they made a run. And now everybody else around the league is looking and going, I want to go play there because I want to go and I want to go play there because of two reasons. One, they're a competitive team that seem well coached and well positioned to make a run. 
but the atmosphere was great too. Like people are looking at yeah. the atmosphere are you and going, me? I want to go play in they, a city like that that yeah. ate it ate it up from the start, you know? Yeah, they adapted to that type of hockey. I don't know why I do this, but when I watch I think of the poor people that live in Manitoba and play for the Winnipeg <laughs> Jets. It's like, ooh, a tough bounce. Not the yeah, not, not quite the same yeah. not quite quite the same environment, right? No, not at all. It's a totally different city out there. It's it's, it's wild. It, it, yeah, it's it's just a little bit of a different kind of road trip as opposed to Winnipeg, you know, or something. I've I've heard all about it and stuff like that. I know it's not like the same kind of entertainment value as some of the other places do, but there's teams that use that as motivation too. I, I know that that's a thing too, where when you go to one of those places where there's not as much to do, then you're spending more time with each other in an, in nor- in a normal world, obviously, and we're not in a normal world right now, but beside the point. Like you do spend more time with your own teammates and it becomes a team building exercise more than it does become a just let's go out and let's have some fun on the town and let's take in everything that this city has to offer because that's that's the bottom line. That's what they get to do for a living. They get to travel for a living and play hockey. You know, I know. So what you do on the side of it, you know, have a little bit of fun. Go see what the town's all about because you're playing in that city for what you're in. You're playing that city one night and you're in it for two, maybe. So go ahead and have some fun on that one night where you're just hanging out. Yeah, and you mentioned in a normal world. Well, well, on this show, the normal world is having Johnny Gaudreau join us to talk about what is happening with the Calgary Flames right now, the recent stretch, and everything about the team. So, without further ado, let's throw it over to the interview. We are now joined by Johnny Gaudreau, left winger of the Calgary Flames. Johnny, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Just living the dream, talking hockey. It's fantastic. So I just want to kind of hop in here. We're now a good portion into the season. Teams are starting to learn their identity. And obviously, the team is fighting in this tough Canadian division. But you are coming out to such a hot start. Eight goals, 15 points in 14 games. What do you credit the most for this type of stretch to begin the season? Yeah, I think uh, a lot. A lot of it has to do with our power play. I think our power play has been really good this year. Um, we've had a lot of success on our power play, so uh, and it's helped us win a few games this year. So um, that's been really important, and uh, you know, kind of just uh, you know, sticking with it. I know it's a cliche, but you know, sometimes you go through stretches and ups and downs where it's just not going for you, and uh, you know, they're falling for me right now, and I'm finding the net, and uh, you know, it's it's going good. <laughs> Yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, Johnny, this is Kevin Durso, co-hosting with Broads here, and it's I gotta say, first of all, the hot start is certainly helping my fantasy team this year, but so good, good stuff. Uh, the dynamic of playing in Canada is compared to the other markets around the U.S., especially in this particular season. What's it like not only playing among the same group of teams in another country while still being connected to the league, but also the magnitude of each game within the division? Yeah, it's huge. I mean. If, just looking at it, I mean, every game is is so important. Every game's a four point game. I mean, uh, and you want to try to get off to to a good start because you know at the end of the day you're going to end up playing these every one of these teams. You're going to be fighting for a playoff spot with these guys, and you know every game is so so crucial. So to get out to a good start as a team and you know try to you know build your points up and and kind of get into a good you know starting point to the season is crucial. But uh, you know, we're kind of fighting fighting it right now a little bit. We have a little things to tweak and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's uh, – like I said, it's so crucial because, you know, you're not just playing against another team in another division who, you know, feels comfortable where they're at. You know, you're, you're just playing against teams, you know, that are they're fighting for playoff spots with you. So it, it, it's, uh, it's a lot different this year, but um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, being in the Philadelphia area, that Flyers Penguins is big and Eagles Cowboys is big. You're involved in one up there in Alberta, and every time I see the Flames are playing Edmonton, it's must watch television. What's it like playing in in that type of matchup? Because the intensity is absolutely there. Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, like you said, I mean, whether you're from, you know, the Philly area, you know, the New England area, you know, you're hearing about the Battle of Alberta and. You know, you got Dreisaitl and McDavid who are, you know, absolutely insane at playing hockey. And, you know, you got to kind of, you know, watch them on the ice. But then, you know, there's a little grit to the game too and stuff like that. So it's just, you know, a lot of stuff goes into that game. It's really fun to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, we got the upper hand on them, you know, the first time we played them this year. But like you said, I mean, we play them nine more times and, you know, it's – 
uh, playing against them in, in your own division, it, it, it's going to get it's going to get pretty wild here. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to ask you about Jacob Markstrom because that to that to that point about playing a lot of those types of guys. To me, he's one of the most underrated goalies in the league. I was insanely impressed with the season he had in Vancouver last year. I thought he deserved some Vesna consideration, and I I believe he's a huge pickup to the Flames this season. When you have a guy like that who's behind you, someone who's capable of keeping you in a game and keeping it close when you play against high powered offenses and pl- ha- play in games where maybe you're facing your, or the opposition gets 35, 40 shots in a game. How much does that impact your team? Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the way he's played for us this year, I feel like as a, as a team, we haven't really played our best hockey this year. And he's, he stole, you know, two, three games for us this year. And, and, uh, you know, it's it's crazy what he's doing. I mean, I I always knew he was a good goaltender, you know, playing against him, you know, three, four times a year. But um, the way he's played this year for us has been crazy. And, and uh, you know, we could easily, you know, be sitting at, you know, three, four wins instead of the seven we have because of the way he's played. So, and just like last night, I mean, we had no business being in that game in the third. I think it was 1-1 one, one with five minutes left. And we just weren't playing a great game as a team. And, uh you know, next thing you know, you see the shots are like forty to fifteen, and it's a one-one game going in, into the into the third. So, um, you know, he he's been unbelievable for us, and uh, you know, he doesn't deserve enough credit. Like you said, I think you know, I I don't I see him winning a Vesna, uh, you know, real soon here. That would be fantastic. When you play these games now, obviously with the COVID situation, it seems like you're getting accustomed to the lifestyle of no fans. But are you? Are are you used to this? Is it weird? Do you still go out there and sometimes it feels awkward? What's it like playing in that type of atmosphere? Yeah, I feel like I'm kind of getting used to it at this point. I mean, you know, it's it's it was really strange at first during the bubble and playoffs. Uh, at the end of last season and then this year you know kind of went into a first game you know I expect like you know a big crowd you know it's the start of the season you know everyone's jacked up and you know you can hear a pin drop in there so um it's a little it's a tough at times you know it's it's hard to you know you get that uh momentum sometimes from your from your fans behind you and stuff when you're playing well or or a big shift in the offensive zone and you hear the fans you know you know cheering and stuff but um you know, it's, uh, you know, it's the world we live in right now, you know, hopefully, you know, we can get back to, you know, having our fans there and stuff, but, uh, it's just been, uh, it's been crazy. And, and to that point, how big is a player like Matt Kachuk, someone who really gets the energy going for the boys and plays with that attitude, plays on the edge when you're in this type of environment, what's it like to have someone who, you know, he plays on that, on that line, but that can definitely swing emotions. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, Chucky, you know, he's, he's a smart player. He's a very, very skilled player. Um, you know, can see the ice really well, but at the same time, you know, he, he's a guy who can, you know, get into those dirty areas, you know, throw his body around and, um, you know, he's just an all around player and that's guys, you, the type of guys you want on your team, you know, you, you win games with guys like that. So, um, you know, to have him, uh, on our team, it's been great. And, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, we can kind of, turn our season around here a little bit i know it's early but you know we haven't been playing our best hockey but i mean uh you know chucky he's uh you know he's a great player you know a great teammate and uh you know love playing with him and you know that that's the type of player that fans love to see you know who can throw the body around he can score a goal between his legs from behind the net i mean just uh you know a great player Broad's kind of set me up nicely for that one because he already mentioned one of your teammates so i got two more that i want to touch on and i've been fortunate enough as a member of the media to see you play several times in Philly and to see some of your teammates who have been there for a while. I'm thinking of Sean Monahan and Mark Giordano, these two guys who have just been fixtures of this team for a long time and, and steady players on this team as well. Just the, the familiarity you have with them. Can you talk about how easy it is to kind of play alongside of them when they're really going like they are and to come into a shortened season, having to get on the same page as quickly as possible when you have played with guys like that for a long time? Yeah, I mean, uh, those two guys, I've played my whole career with them. So, I mean, uh, you know, they're great friends off the ice and, you know, great teammates on the ice and great players. So um, to be able to, you know, have a core group that's been here for, you know, seven, eight years since I've been here, it's been it's been fantastic. And I know it's uh, hasn't been, you know, we haven't really accomplished what we wanted, but, you know, we, we've we've went deep 
relatively deep in playoffs a few times. And, you know, I feel like most of the time I'm here, I think I've only, we've only missed the playoffs two times, three times maybe. So, um, but, uh, you know, those are two of our biggest leaders and they've been here for a while and, you know, we know how much it means to, you know, have a great season and try to, to win a cup in Calgary. Cause you know, it's, uh, it's been a long time for Calgary. So, you know, we know how it's important for us to win, but we know how much the city wants it and, and stuff like that. So I think, uh, you know, kind of hits home with us a little bit more when you've been here for so long and, you know, you've uh, been with this organization for so long. So it's difficult at times, you know, um, you know, not, you know, obviously winning. I mean, I mean it's a hard, it's hard to win that trophy, but um, you know, it's, uh, you know, each year, you know, you, you got one less year with, with these guys and you, you just want to, you know, try to accomplish your goal together. And, um, you know, we'll see, we have, we have a good group in our, in our, in our locker room here. So we got to, you know, start playing the way we can and the way we know how to, and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we can do something special this year. No doubt about it. I got a question that's not related to the Calgary flames, but it's a hot topic in the NHL world right now. Those golden Knights helmets, Give me your honest opinion on what you thought when you saw the Vegas Golden Knights throw those bad boys on. I kind of liked them. I thought no, they were, come they were, on. <laughs> There's no way you kind of like them. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's you, you don't see you don't see uh, you know many helmets like that. So I kind of I kind of uh, thought they were pretty unique, and I really think it's. Cool I, said how, how, I said uh, honest. I said honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean the the whole retro idea and you know the third jersey. I think it's really, really, really unique and and the cool uh, kind of thing that NHL did. So, I mean, obviously, I think some some people might not. I think I saw a meme about like the weekend on one of them. I thought that was pretty hilarious. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe it'll grow in some people, but I, I thought it was kind of a, a cool touch. <laughs> I I got to keep kind of going on with this a little bit cuz you brought up the reverse retro stuff and the jerseys are a big thing this year. There's a lot to like about what many teams have done with their designs and they like you guys are wearing the black blasty jerseys which for me I see that and I think of a guy who wore an, one number below you, number 12 Jerome McGinley and it takes me right back to that to see him skating around having success wearing that uniform. How much do these jerseys allow you guys to kind of tap into the nostalgia of the game a little bit and kind of create new chapters cuz for me seeing you score in that jersey in the first game you guys wore that kind of takes me right back to the early 2000s yeah it's awesome i mean you know uh getting to wear jerseys that you know that's been in this organization for a long time and you know fans haven't seen it in a long time and you know it kind of brings back like with not playing anyone in in the arena you know it's hard to you know create create some momentum and like you know get going for games sometimes because you know there's literally no one in the building so when you get to throw on like a, a sweet jersey like that that's been around for so so long and you know it hasn't been worn in a long time you know you could you could see the guys in the locker room get you know have an extra jump or two in their step and warm-ups and stuff and you know feel good wearing them so um you know we felt really you know really really excited to wear that and um i think i was here i heard a story about how they weren't a big hit in Calgary when they first came out and <laughs> um, they kind of put them, put them to, to rest. And then I feel like they kind of just took off and haven't seen it in a while. And uh, just a really cool, uh, you know, cool thing to be a part of. Yeah. For the most part, I like a lot of the ones that the NHL came out with. There's a few that make me scratch my head, but uh, they look good for the most part. But um, all right, we'll leave you with this, Johnny. Who is the funniest guy in the locker room? Well, my team. Yes. Uh, Jeez, um, there's a few funny characters. Uh, I th- I feel like uh, just being so close to Sean Monahan, and he's just little things he says under under his breath that kind of you know get me chuckling pretty good. And uh, um, Rasmus Anderson's got a got a big mouth, so he's always hooting and hollering in the locker room. So he's a pretty funny guy too. But um, no no one that really stands out too too much, but just a you know, like I said, we have a really tight group in our locker room and a lot of jokes and, and funny times in our locker room. So it, it's, a, it's a good tight, tight group in our, in our locker room. Awesome. That's so awesome. Well, thank you so much, Johnny, and we'll catch up with you next week after you guys play a couple more games. All right. Thanks for having me, guys.
All right, that was a fantastic interview with Johnny Gaudreau. Once again, I can't wait to have him on weekly to get some updates throughout the season. And he did touch on one thing that really stood out to me, Durso. He said that this team is not there yet, but they're getting closer to where they need to be. When you look at this Calgary Flames team, they have a lot of great pieces, and, and we touched on the goaltending and how much of a difference that is, and they do have veteran leaders. Giordano's been back there, and he's someone that you can absolutely rely on. What do you think that they're missing, or do you think that they're not missing much? They just need to, to learn their identity this year, because you can always bring guys back and make minor moves, but every season, you do have to relearn and mold your team to what your identity is going to be and how exactly you're going to operate, and, and there's one big big, big storyline with this team that is somewhat hovering a black cloud, and, and that's Sam Bennett. What is going on with Sam Bennett? Are they going to move on from him? He's a postseason guy, if you will, which do you want to move on from someone who succeeds in the postseason? If he's not happy, what do you do? So, so there's so much there. What do you see in the Flames right now, though? I think he's right. You know, I think there's a lot of pieces that, like, not just the pieces that are in place, but I think there's a lot of things that they're doing well. But one of the things that's tough about this season is that you have to, you know, not you have to, but you're going to, when you're playing the same team constantly. So when you play the same team in back to back games or three in a row and they're playing g more games against the opponents because there's fewer teams in that division than the rest of them you get this sense that the opposition can learn a, learn something about you. So they they beat Vancouver on Thursday, but then they played him on Saturday, and now Vancouver had had a lot more control, and you heard him talk about how they he didn't, didn't feel like they had the best game. You know? Dude, they played them and, four games in a row. That's got to right, be so it, brutal. But, it, but that's like a playoff series, and if you're Definitely. in a playoff series, you have to learn how to adjust that quickly. So it, it's not a matter of that they, they're not capable of adjusting, but the other team's doing the same thing. That's what's hard, and you heard him talk about with the core group how – it, they want to win a Stanley Cup for Calgary and they love the fan base and they know that the fan base wants it, but it is the toughest trophy to win. So, you know, everybody's fighting for that and everybody's thinking they've got a shot. And I think especially this year, everybody really thinks they've got a shot. So because of that, they're all trying to make those quick adjustments to playing the same team over again. And it's really been an interesting dynamic, especially in this division, because sometimes the other divisions we're seeing the back to backs, we're seeing two games in a row and then moving on to the next one. Probably these are three or four in a row against the same team. And you really get to build up the animosity and you really get to build up a sense that you can learn a lot about the opponent you're playing in a short period of time. And that's where I think the struggle is right now for Calgary. Cause I, they're right there. I mean, I'm looking at the standings right now. They are right there and they've got fewer games played than three of the teams in front of them. So they're right there. But at the same time, you it's making that adjustment so quickly. And when you've got pieces like they do, and I think that you've had, when you've had them for as long as they've had them, you know, at this point in time, Matthew Kachuk is part of that core. And even though he's one of the younger guys on that side, and then, between Johnny Gaudreau and between Sean Monahan and, and Mark Giordano and all those guys. And now you've got a goalie back there too, who really carries a lot of weight and has a lot of impact on the results of these games. He did with Vancouver. He does now with Calgary. You know, Johnny said it too. He said about how they, he, they feel like Markstrom has stolen them some games this year. And that's how they've got the number of wins they do. That's never a bad thing when you're early in the year trying to get into a rhythm, which I think they are still trying to get into a rhythm, and it's hard to do. You know, they're 14 games in, which is a quarter of the season. They're trying to get there, and they'll get there with time if they can put it together. I think the biggest areas that they can is special teams, you know, power play. You've got a lot of good pieces on that power play. If you can really get that rolling, that could be the game changer for this team. And that's you read my the, mind. Yeah, that maybe that's maybe the area that needs the most improvement possibly is and and sometimes improvement. I say improvement like as if there's big issues with it. Sometimes it's just a matter of you're not getting the breaks, you're not getting the bounces and you're that close, but it's just not quite falling right for you. And when it does, it's going to be just coming in waves. So I think they're getting closer and closer to being that kind of team. I feel I watch them play some nights, and I'm thinking, damn, this Calgary Flames team is solid as hell. And then I watched their last game against Vancouver, and they had seven or eight shots halfway through the game. All Vancouver had 20-plus, and it kind of looked like the Flyers. not going to lie to you. They couldn't get a damn shot on net. So it's very inconsistent. When they look good, they do look very strong, and they look like a team that can do some damage. And then there's times where just mental mistakes and, and a lot of disappointing looks and just frustrating moments where where sometimes it's very self-inflicting, and if they if they just 
make sure that they're making the proper plays. And that's not to take away any credit from the other team forcing them to make errors. But, you know, a lot of the times there is self-inflicted wounds involved, just poor decision-making and, and slow reads. It's it's kind of crazy to see the team play so well throughout and then there's stretches of, what the hell? What What is going on? How did that flip-flop? And when, when you look at the top of this division, because as we're kind of moving up here, we started with Ottawa, Vancouver struggling, Calgary's in that mix, Winnipeg, I'm waiting to see more out of Pierre-Luc Dubois and see what's going to go out there in Winnipeg. They've kind of just been eh, flying through the radar a little bit after yeah. the start of the season. But now we're starting to hit the category of, okay, Edmonton. Okay, you have Montreal at the top. The Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, this Edmonton, when you have Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl, you're always going to be in the mix. I, I can't believe we're going to watch Connor McDavid get over 115 points in a 56-game season. <laughs> I, I mean, it, it is outrageous. And at the same time, see, I look at that type of stuff and I go, how is this team third in this division? You know, I, I really wonder how with those two players, how you're still not at the very top. I had them as the team that I thought would make win this division because I think that it seems too good to be true. You've got Connor McDavid. You've got Leon Dreisaitl. You've got these pieces in place and they make everybody around them better. doesn't matter who you are. And yet they still can't seem to get to the top of the mountain here, you know, and it's it, it's just baffling to me that you have two of the best players in the world it's not just one you have two of the best players in the world and it's still not quite clicking for you for the rest of the team those guys can get going whenever they want to and I think that those guys have had trouble getting going sometimes too because the rest of their teammates have made it easy for the opposition to key on them and to focus strictly on them and where they go and not taking care of business themselves with the other opportunities if they're not in a position to score goals meaning these other players and McDavid has to do it all or Dreisaitl has to do it all, then they might not win games because of it because you're waiting for the other guy to step up and make that play and he's not in the right position to make that play. And that can hurt you defensively too because you're thinking that you, when those guys have control that – it's a sure thing, and it's never Dude. a sure thing, even in this league. You know, McDavid pisses me off. The fact that he <laughs> can do what he does, it's ridiculous. Uh, he goes end-to-end -end with ease, and it, it just dominates the game. It, it's absolutely absurd to watch a human being skate that fast, stick handle that smoothly, score that easily. The vision, I, I, it doesn't make sense to me that he's not doing— This is what it looks like when you're an NHL player, but you're still playing junior, <laughs> and you're playing in the OHL or the dub or anything like that. This is what happens when you play that level of hockey. You should not be able to consistently destroy opponents at this rate, make them look this silly in the NHL. It's bonkers. And I, I kind of want to relate it to, and it's not the same thing, but it had to have been that vibe. Wayne Gretzky. Everyone talks about Wayne Gretzky in his prime just on a, on a different level, and he would do things that nobody in the entire league could really do. Now, some of the old heads out there would say, how dare you compare Wayne Gretzky? It's like the, it's the LeBron MJ thing. The people who grew up with <laughs> MJ will never give it up, and I'm not trying to say that Wayne Gretzky doesn't deserve to be the greatest hockey player of all time, but when you watch him play compared to everybody else in the league and the best of the best in the league, he's so separated. And this is coming from a Crosby guy who I love Crosby and all the tiny things that he does. He doesn't make those end-to-end -end plays like McDavid does. He does all the little, tiny, intangible stuff that makes him so dominant. But damn, Connor McDavid, will we ever see anything like this again? Well, you bring up a good point because here's the thing. The game changes in different ways. So there can be a greatest player for every era that there is. So Wayne Gretzky is the greatest player. Now he might be, and he might go down in history as the greatest hockey player ever. I think he is. But he also played in an era when the game was different than what it is now. Same thing can be said for Gordy Howe back in his day where he's playing in a, a different era than when Gretzky played. The game changed then and the game will change as it goes on and so on. I'm, I'm really disappointed that I don't get to have the perspective to what that I have when I've watched a game as part of the media that I don't get to see Connor McDavid this year. Cause I really would like to see him from that perspective. It, it I, I've watched, you know, I, I believe I told you this after I watched one game where Crosby played and I go, he glides faster than most people skate. And I can only imagine what it's like for McDavid because from, I don't know what would, what would you say? I would be like 350 feet away from the press box all the way upstairs when I normally watch a game he looks ridiculously fast and he is that is his bread and butter right there that is his clear cut number one attribute 
is that the speed is where he builds his whole game from. He's got all the other good tools in the toolbox. Don't get me wrong. He's a good stick handler. He can make moves with so much ease and makes it look simple and like he's straight out of the video game or something like that. And he's got a great shot and great vision and sets everybody up really well. But that's the calling card for him is it's his speed. He's just one of the fastest skaters we'll ever see. And I don't, I don't know if we'll ever see anybody who's quite like him. I think we've, we had this conversation a little while back long before we were doing this, where we talked about, you were talking to me about Lafreniere and about, you know, here's a kid who is he kind of like, well, look at the slump he's going through to start his career. And I kind of think that the McDavid's and the Austin Matthews and guys like that who go first overall that come in as generational talent, potentially, we almost got spoiled with that to an extent where we start to compare everybody to those guys. Cause we sit there and we're looking at Lafreniere and going, got a little McDavid in him, I think, you know, or whatever. And you're going, does he really though, is, does he really have that quality to his game? I don't know yet. It could, it's early. It could, that key very well could, but I really don't love that. We throw that on somebody in his first game of the, of his career at 18 years yeah, old. The expectations are way too outrageous because of what right. other players do, but it's, but it's because of the number of years that we've been able to say this, almost in a row, you know, there's not only sometimes not just one, but there's two guys who come out of the draft and you go, these two guys are going to be better than everybody else in the draft for years to come. And then we start to compare them to the next group and the next group. And then you're realizing that maybe those groups down the line, you know, we did this, you know, years back when it was Nico Heischer and Nolan Patrick were the number one and two, and it was kind of a battle of who was the best one. And, and then to an extent it was, it doesn't matter because whoever gets them, they're going to be, get a really great player. And neither of them has taken off to that kind of level. And that's okay because not every year do you, do you get a Matthews line or a McDavid Eichel. You don't just get those every day. And we had that for two years in a row. It's just outstanding. Yeah, no doubt about it. The youth and the the speed and, and where the game is going, I love it. Now, I fight with Billy Schwime of 97.3 every single day because he wants the old school hockey back where, you know, there's goons throwing punches every day. No, no, no. Give me four lines of youth and speed and maybe mix in a raffle and I'm good to go. <laughs> I want the young core and the four lines that you can roll. But you mentioned Austin Matthews. And when we look at the top of this division, the Canadians with Toffoli being unbelievable, Suzuki looked like he's going to grow into a stud, and Carey Price being the netminder that he is. They're super fun to watch, although they're playing Toronto right now, and I thought the first game when Toronto won, it didn't live up to expectations. I thought it would be more of a fun, entertaining game. It was kind of a blah game that Toronto won, but Montreal squeaked one out in the second game. That wasn't pretty or gorgeous by any means either. Are they becoming more of themselves? Or are they falling back to reality a little bit, or do you still think that they are this powerful team? I just look at them last year, and I acknowledge that it's year to year in all of these sports, but last year they had to win that play-in round against the Penguins to play the Flyers, and they gave the Flyers a run for their money, but I don't know if you go from that with a couple changes to where you are right now, but I, but to tie a little bit of the Vancouver downfall to the Toffoli thing, the amount of goals that Toffoli has this <laughs> season against Vancouver, it's like a big spit in the face. Yeah, it really is. I mean, talk about a change of scenery there where he goes from that team where he was pretty effective anyway and now really takes it to a new place for him. It's It's been interesting. Look, I got a really good look at this Montreal team from that playoff series because I have to eat up that whole series and, you know, eat, sleep, and breathe it the entire time it's going on, you know, because of, of all my Flyers coverage. I came out of that series and I went, this team's going to be good for a while. They got a lot of good young players. And Suzuki is definitely at the top of that list for me. I think he's going to be outstanding. Um, you know, Kokaniemi's got still some growing to do, but he's getting on the right track. I think I think the additions of guys like Toffoli and Tomas Tatar and, and guys like that can help a Kokaniemi because of the fact that he doesn't have to be the number one guy. They, they've kind of got these other pieces in place at forward where they're able to balance that out and it's it's a healthy mix of vets and younger guys trying to rise through the ranks but man do they have like do they just have, they just have an energy about them and you you said you called it they squeaked out that game against Toronto that that's exactly the team that I remember watching late last year they just would find a way to win some games and sometimes they found a way to win and they were the better team and they had to find the way because it was a close game because they're playing tough competitive teams and sometimes they find a way because they're playing against a team that's got their number for a little while that's really doing damage to them and getting a lot of shots and controlling the play, 
and they find a way. And that's the, that's the key of a carry price. You still got a guy in goal who's really good and isn't going anywhere. And that's the, that's the best part for them is they've got the goalie. I really think that Shea Weber has totally turned his game back around to become one of these guys that we have to talk about a lot more. You know, it was almost like he was becoming the forgotten on the downslope twilight of his career kind of guy. And he's revitalized his career completely. And I even like, you know, I even like Jeff Petrie in that sense. Like he's Definitely. even another guy who Definitely. you just he fills the right roles, does a lot of the little things the right way, provides some offense too. I mean, at one point in time, he was one of their leading scorers, I think. And like, that's just out, outrageous, but he, it, he's that kind of player. He's really been such a key asset for that team. So I'm not surprised. That's probably the least surprising thing about the division is I'm not surprised that this team is as good as they are because they were showing signs of it in the playoffs a year ago and, or, not a year ago, but over the summer, and they've con- they just picked up right where they left off in my mind. So that's that not a surprise at all. Yeah, you had a little more optimism than I did for that. I, I mean, I knew that they would be a, a competitive team, but to take this type of jump where now you're talking about them over the Toronto Maple Leafs, maybe that's crazy. I love watching this Maple Leafs team, and, and they kind of have that Dallas Cowboys feel, which is why I, I find it fascinating. You hate <laughs> them or you love them. That's what it's like in Toronto. They are that team. It's the Dallas Stars logo. You're a part of them, or everyone roots against them. And I thought early on, I was appreciating watching Austin Matthews and these young guys, Mitch Marner, play with Joe Thornton. And then Thornton went down, although I think I saw on the headlines on NHL.com that he's close to return. But then you saw Wayne Simmons. It felt like you saw Wayne Simmons get back to his version of himself. And then he got into an injury problem as well. So he's missing time. But I really do enjoy watching this Maple Leafs team. And I still think that they... They're better at the end of the day. It's a small sample size right now. I still think that they're better than Montreal with John Tavares and and the depth that they have. And if they get healthy, I I do believe that they are the better team. I just, man, that's another team where when I watch at night and I check out, all right, what do we got tonight? If When I see that logo, I'm going, yeah, baby, give me that. I love it. Austin Matthews, you know, he's scoring eight games in a row nonstop. Talk about growing into a superstar. Not that we ever questioned if he was going to be one or not because we always saw that he was able to put the biscuit in the net. I mean, that shot is lethal. It's filthy. It reminds me of a an Ovechkin shot that you know is coming and you still can't do anything about it. That's the Austin Matthews shot. You know it's coming. You know what he's going to do. Good luck stopping it. You're not going to be able to do it. And he's constantly scoring and he's constantly taking that step. And I think that's big considering, look, that John Tavares move was big. Awesome signing. The ties were there too from the emotional standpoint. It's a lot of money tied to a guy. The fact that you don't have to rely on him to be that guy and it can be Austin Matthews. He could be Mitch Marner. I think it only adds value to that depth that I was speaking about before. The, the the difference between Austin Matthews shot and Alex Ovechkin shot, and it's not to take away from Ovechkin shot at all, is Ovechkin has a spot on the ice where you know to look for it. Matthews is taking it from everywhere. Yeah, and the he's corner, just, behind and, the goal line, you name it. He's yeah, he's just throwing it from anywhere, and it's lethal every single time. That's the that's the scary part. He really is a sharpshooter in every sense of the word. And I definitely, you know, I'm not surprised by this at all. I mean, when he went out and scored four times in his first game, you know, I think that that kind of set the tone for what we were to expect from this guy, you know, and I, I mean, not even McDavid did that, right? You know, well, he couldn't, he could like, keep it up though. It's a, yeah, no, I, soft, I hear you. That's soft out of him. You go, like, do it once, <laughs> you know what I mean? But nonetheless, I mean, this is a team that's loaded with talent and I kind of, I remember watching him in the playoffs over the summer and being like, you know, this team just disappoints me with the talent that they have, that they don't seem to be able to get it done that they, you know, it it almost seems so predictable that they ended up, you know, after they had that big comeback against Columbus in game four and they had to play game five to decide the series, it almost seems so predictable that they had to let down right after that, because that just seemed like the way that the team was. And, Maybe they're starting to finally hit that stride. Maybe they have the good mix. You know, they've tried to do that veteran mix with the young guys that are building this core up with the Marners and Matthews and guys like that. And they did that with Marlowe for a while. And I don't know if Marlowe brings the same type of game that Thornton does, you know, because Thornton's even bigger than Marlowe is and has a little bit of that rougher edge to him. And maybe that just gives them that little uh, and uh, look, throw Wayne Simmons in there, too, because Wayne Simmons is the gritty rough around the edges kind of guy, too, who does that dirty work. And maybe that's what also helps, because you're keeping an eye on him down at the net and two guys who can shoot really well are standing there just waiting for or make it three when it's their power play, because I'm sure that at that point in time, Tavares is out there with Marner and Matthews. Not a bad recipe for success when you have those guys out there and just 
dishing it to each other and making things happen. You know, they're just such a deep team. And I'm not surprised that they're having the success they are right now. It's just more or less that it's the playoff translation. I think that's a bigger deal because I don't think anybody doubts that they're going to be a playoff team. It's once you get there, what no, are they going to the do six, after it's that? It's the Sixers effect. It really is. They're in that same mindset we are here in Philadelphia with the Sixers. Oh, that's great. You're winning regular season games. Ben Simmons is phenomenal. Do it when it matters because you haven't been able to to this point. And that is definitely the noise surrounding Toronto. Yeah, for sure. And it, look, it's going to take a long time to get to that point. We're still just a quarter of the way through the season. And we've got a long way to go until we get there to see what they have in a playoff setting, but they're at least setting themselves up the right way because they might get, you know, do you really want to be the team that finishes second or third and has to play it? You know, if you're Montreal and you finish second, do you really want to be the team that plays Edmonton in the first round of the playoffs? You know, do, so do you think Toronto wants to be the team that with all of the noise that surrounds them with, how they succeed in the playoffs and things like that and their lack of success with these core guys that they've drafted over the years. Do you want to play the Edmonton team and have McDavid and Dreisaitl get hot at the right time and now put you out of the playoffs again in the first round? And, and, and there's the storyline that just follows you around. Or do you want to really establish yourself, be the number one team, have whoever finishes fourth in that division have had to grind it out against the other teams battling for that spot. So it's probably going to come down to the end and you're going to be fresher and ready to go. And they're going to be tired because they had to work so hard to get into the playoffs and it might set you up to win a series and set you up for that second round game or second round match against one of those teams that's left, you know, a Montreal or a, or an Edmonton or something like that. Cause I really do think that those are maybe the three teams that unless something big happens, they probably will be the three that are there toward the end. Maybe Montreal has the biggest recipe for that to happen, to go down the other direction because of the fact that it just takes, you know, maybe takes one injury or it takes one slump for some guy. And that's the end of it. Or Carey price gets into a bad situation and has a couple of rough starts in a row. And now he's not keeping you in games. That's all it takes for one team to just fall right out of the running that quickly and to lose their spot and be battling for their playoff lives. So I'd be interested to see where they finish, but Toronto is already off to that good start and they're very rarely losing games in regulation, which is just another category of it, that's the, that's really one of the keys to success because there's no guarantees that you're going to get the 56 games. And we've seen that there's no guarantees. So if you can win as many games as you can, where the point percentage goes up just a little bit, every single night, you're setting yourself up to be right there at the top every single time. That's and that's the, that, that's the, that's the thing right there. Yeah. It's a great point for sure. And, and the common th- conversation surrounding that team always is the defense and you know you get TJ Brody and you have Hull out there who's playing fantastic they're loving him as this top four I I hear Toronto sports radio talking all the time like oh yeah we sure saw that coming and they're thrilled (laughs) to see it all happening defensively so that that was obviously an area that they needed to get better at and it seemed like they did that so uh so look with that being said we figured this would happen. We had all these ideas like, oh, we'll, we'll do this and that. And then, bang, we just start flowing and it's nonstop uh, coming out of our mouths. And I thought that was beautiful, Durso. How about yourself? Oh, I've I've enjoyed it already. And there's more to come. I can tell you that there's going to be way more to come. And we've got a lot of hockey left this season to talk about. Oh. <laughs> Yes, we do, my friend. Yes, we do. (laughs) So with that being said, thank you guys all so much for listening to the first episode of Open Ice Hits. And we will see you later on this week, Thursday. And we got some topics to throw around. One being the Pittsburgh Penguins. What's next for them? Uh, Big moves that happened over this last recent week or so. And, you know, it changes the franchise. What are they going to do? Are they going to go try and win that championship? Is it time to rebuild? What about the personalities they brought in? It's not as if they brought in, you know, these lower guys. No, no, no. Talk about some personalities that might be going head to head. We'll talk about it later on in the week. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you next time.